cause I've been driving this train Years in this lane, there's no stopping this flame Cause I came to the game and I changed it to play How I like rearranged it to my own domain Yeah, I got what it takes, made lots of mistakes Hey everybody, how you doing? This is Ilea Welcome my love bugs and welcome to my viewers that have not subscribed yet If you haven't subscribed yet, then come on over to my lighting is messing up on me. Come on over here. You've been viewing me for quite some time. Press that subscribe button. Press that subscribe button. Press that subscribe button. Okay. And then just welcome on into the family. Um, now. Um I've been talking about Tiffany Haddish, and I, I had to do some research on her and just figure out why in the world do I I don't like her. Um, I figured it out, and it's going to trip you out the way I'm getting ready to tell you why I don't like her. Because I was taught this in Bible, Bible school. I was, you know, vacation Bible study, uh, Bible study, uh, uh, church, uh, I was taught this, okay, I was taught to don't like nobody, because it, when you don't like no, this person, or that person, or whatever person, it's only because they reflect something from you, I'm taking accountability ability for me not liking her, and when I did my little research, I, I did pick up a video, and I'm going to play the video afterwards. It's going to be playing while I'm talking. And then I'm going to play the whole video. But um, <clears throat> I still, even though I know her some most of her life now, um, I watched her go from, you know, this humbleness but ratchetness at the same time. I watched her just continue to be in a humble ratchet, rat, ratchetness for years and I didn't like her and um I'm 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 finding out why because I was like that loud obnoxious to say whatever the heck heck I feel but I do it now in a way where it's just not offensive she does stuff in offense and right now I did not know that we weren't the same age she's younger than me and um I'm gonna I'm gonna school you I'm going to school you. I'm going to teach you something. Okay. And I, I'm going to teach everybody else too here on my YouTube. Okay. It's, it's all about how you receive it. If you receive it in a good way, that's good. You're going you're gonna to get something out of it. If you, if you receive it in a bad way, that's your fault. Because you, you're not hearing me. Okay. There is a difference between listening and hearing. Okay. And when you are a listener... You hear, you only listen to what you want to hear. And when you are a hearer, you hear the whole and fullness of what the person is saying and not take nothing out of context and only apply what applies to you to you and not, you know, em embody negative things that I might be saying and, and embody, it, embody it and think that I'm strictly talking negative about you. And it's not even about you. It's about what I feel about Tiffany Haddish and why I feel the way I feel towards her. And I'm all, I'm still naturally loud because I'm deaf in one ear. Okay? I can't hear out this ear. So when I talk, I'm actually trying to force myself to make sure I can understand what I'm saying at the same time of talking to other people. Now, when I, when I go up a few octaves, it's only because I feel like you're not hearing me. And a lot of people don't hear me. They listen and they don't hear. They pick and choose context words that triggers you. Okay? I don't want that. Okay? I get loud after that. Then I'm starting to yell when I get irritated. Now I'm irritated. I'm about ready to just bubble up. But I come to find that Tiffany Haddish is somewhat like this too. Not 100%. But we've both been through the same stuff. You know, I was brought up in EC. I was born in California, Los Angeles, to be able to to be honest. I had never seen Cali California a day in my life. I mean, 
if if I did, it was only in, in that one year period of being born on this earth. Okay, and then I moved here to Ohio, and I think our first place we went to that I can remember is Kings Highway. If I is out there in Warrensville, you know. Um, then we went from Warrensville to Glenmont, from Glenmont to Penrose, no, from Glenmont to, um, um, what is this, um, Walford. I live at the address of, of the, the last place we moved to was Penrose before we moved to the Cleveland Heights where I there dropped out of school. Okay. Now. The reason why I don't like her is because she's me. That's saying a lot. And I take accountability for being who I am because of me. Um, I embodied a lot of things in my life. All right, my camera went off. I'm sorry, you guys. But I embodied a lot of things in my life that I just I gravitated to negatively and did not grow from it. Nobody even gave me the opportunity to even, you know, they didn't show me the way properly, okay? And I can't blame nobody. Now, in my older age, I'm 50. I didn't have a grow-up time until I was 44 years old, okay? I, I played the blame game on everybody but, you know, what was supposed to be done to grow from and learn from and use it as a stepping stone instead of using it as a negative force in my life, I went into depression. I spent 15 years in hell instead of in jail. You know, mentally I was gone. Like I, I was inside myself and a whole nother person was on the outside being this, trying to be me and, and it wasn't working. And people will say, this is not how you act, Rhonda. Why are you acting like this? Why are you, you're not the same. Rhonda, what, what is going on? I never let anybody really know that I was on medication for depression or anything like that. I didn't even let people know that I was taking therapy. I had, I had been taking therapy long before I was, took therapy for myself. I was put in therapy for some hidden agendas that were, were, were was, you know, being projected on me because I, I, I brought up stuff that, you know, didn't make sense to me. And I, I hit some nerves. I was one of them voiceful type people when something doesn't make sense to me, I'm going to bring it out and I'm going to be very forceful in trying to get that answer. So I was, I was pretty much called crazy in my family at a very young age of like five, six, seven. So my mom got me therapy and all kinds of stuff. I asked her a question. I'm I'm going I'm I'm going somewhere with this, but I asked her a question and it, it this all hell broke loose from that point on. So at eight years old, I just called my mama out. You know what I'm saying? And it just turned into she was my best friend. We could talk about anything, and you know, and and I didn't know that she was in the back of her mind telling everybody my daughter is crazy. Because she was trying to hide what she had going on through me and my sister and anybody else that was involved. You know what I'm saying? Not to talk bad about my mama now. Okay, I love my mama. But, you know, she's not here to defend herself or even embellish on anything or you know, elaborate, I should say. El elaborate on anything that I'm talking about right now. My dad is not even here for him to elaborate on anything I'm talking about. I don't have no backup to anything I'm getting ready to tell you, but I'm going to say this, okay? Tiffany Haddish had a very rough life. I had a rough life as far as being the escape goat to older people's hidden agendas and what they were trying to take to the grave with them you know what i'm saying and they they used me and abused me with it and i got molested i got raped i got you know i i got introduced to things that i wasn't you know ready for um i didn't get introduced to drugs and alcohol until i was about 20 so then you know that's when 
the bottom fell out for me when I got a taste of real alcohol. Not no dang blanket watered down beer that my mom gave to me is to say, if you don't like this, you would never drink that. But it, 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 <laughs> it's just a long story with me. And I'm trying to work myself up to write this book because God want me to write this book. But it, it's supposed to be like super hardcore. It's not a self-help book. It's not a, a you know, a biblical self-help book. It's going to be raw. It's going to have some my raw feelings in there and just be ready when it comes out it probably be out when i have my dying breath but uh because it's taking me a long time to even kick it out because i'm dealing with my own emotions writing this book uh i didn't tore, tore up the the first draft already so just be patient with me but tiffany haddish had a rough life i had a rough life uh, mental health issues and all kinds of stuff. So did she. Uh, I went to school as a honor roll student and turned into a complete F student, and I have dyslexia. Uh, she has a reading um, problem. I mean, I guess she, you know, got past it because look where she is now. Look where I'm going. You know what I'm saying? You can't see it yet, but you you will. Okay, I'm not I'm not dumb as rocks, and I'm nowhere near um. As stupid as people used to call me, okay? But I also knew to humble myself because without God, I could do nothing. You know what I'm saying? And God is a sweet God. He does not run around, you know, jumping inside people and, and, and making a mockery of, of his name. You know what I'm saying? He's not the author of confusion. And when you have God in your life, it's a, it's a certain... Um, uh, 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 way that you go that makes you look different so Tiffany the difference between me and you and I can't judge you on what you're doing and it's all alleged what I'm saying but it, 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 what you see is what you get when it comes to God okay so my camera keep going out y'all so I'm going to tell you when you have God in your life it humbles you and you only know to do what God tells you to do when he's first in your life. You don't have you first or your significant other first or your kids first. God's first. And if you have a husband, God, your husband, and then you. You know what I'm saying? And the only reason why I say your husband first because he's the head of the house. And he should be a man of God too. So whatever he does should reflect what you do. Because you're supposed to leave thy mother and thy father and cleave to thy wife. That does not mean that she has control. It means that she's supposed to submit thyself to the man of God. Not the man of evil. Not the man of disturbance. Not the man of drama. Not the man that don't know how to pay a bill. Not a man who is selfish. Not a man who's not going to do anything for you because you ain't giving him no sex. Not a man who is going to belittle you, make you look dumb in front of people. He, this is not a man who's going to call you a B word at the end of the day. Who's going to call you out your name. Who's going to hit you and smack you and throw you around the room. A man of God has complete and utter communication with God, and he knows how to treat the, the, the rib that fits inside of him. So when you are out here, and you're talking about there was a man that defended his wife, and he did it in an evil, selfish, villainous way, and was provoked by a person to do this even though that was his decision to do it no man should follow any woman especially when he got God in his life 100% a woman should never act like a man <laughs> if she's 100% all in for God because you must submit to God first and to the man of God that he chose for you you got to know the difference if you went out there looking you chose him if you wasn't looking and he came out of the blue you didn't see him coming 
and he treats you like a queen. Y'all talk, and he can let you be you, and y'all can, you know, he is, he doesn't, he doesn't call you out your name. He's not aggressive. Only when you're being hard headed and not submissive. And I, you know, that ain't control, honey, when you're married. It's control when you're not married. Okay? And you're playing house. Yeah. That stuff. When you're playing house, that's a dangerous thing. When you're playing house. Stop playing house. We ain't in kindergarten no more. We ain't trying to be like mommy and daddy. Because mommy and daddy got us messed up in the first place. Because they did not have their identity together. Did not know what they were doing at first. And now that I am older. And I know better. And I'm doing better. You need to watch me now. Because this train ain't stopping just because I had a little downfall for a few years. Mommy made mistakes. Only because she didn't have the right people teaching her correctly so now that i have the 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 um relationship and spiritual journey that i'm on i am learning and still learning and still going to learn on my on my deathbed okay when you stop learning is when you stop breathing you could go from level to level and levels mean a lot of testing if you don't pass the test, you stay right where you are. That's how you do. You, and you keep sitting up there talking about, well, what was me? Pass the test and you can move on. You cannot co continuously let a man that, that is not your man, who's not your husband, okay, who's not committed to you 100%, who's not uh, 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 giving and, 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 and loving and understanding and let and sit down and say hey babe i didn't like the way this went i don't like you doing this you shouldn't have done that because you are a represent representation of your spouse man and woman so when tiffany had it said that there's not a lot of men out here that's defending their wives why don't you get married i know you've been married but you should go to counseling and go and find out what it is. Counseling with a pastor that you trust. Not the ones that's out here all willy-nilly. Okay? It don't even have to be the one out of your church. As long as you find a reparable pastor who can help you. Okay? So, my son is going nuts now. I have to get off of here. I think I said enough. So Jesus loves you and so do I. I may not like your ways, but I love you anyway. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen again. I just had a birthday recently and I had to renew my driver's license and um, I decided that I didn't like the way my life was going so I changed my identity. Um, yeah, I, I checked the Caucasian box. I'm a white woman now. My life has changed drastically. My credit score went Tiffany up Haddish might be the queen of funny, but her life has been anything but a joke. From her rough childhood to marriage troubles, Tiffany has had her fair share of ups and downs. Here's the truth about her sad life story. Tiffany was born in South Central Los Angeles on December 3, 1979. Her mom was an entrepreneur and her dad was an Eritrean refugee. According to her memoir entitled The Last Black Unicorn, her father left their family when she was three and her mom remarried and had four more children. While chatting with The Breakfast Club, Tiffany revealed her mom and stepdad's relationship was very rocky and he had a few different women pregnant at the same time. When she was eight years old, tragedy struck when Tiffany's mom was involved in a terrible car accident. Her mom's head went through the windshields, leaving her severely brain damaged with a very limited vocabulary, which frustrated her mom to the point where she would lash out. Tiffany told Uncensored, she was never the same after that. She wasn't normal anymore. Tiffany told David Letterman that her mom had to learn how to talk, walk, everything all over again. She said that her mom's behavior also changed drastically where she would take things out on Tiffany and call her names like ugly and tell her she hated her. She said her mom would put her hands on her, leaving her bruised. 
All of it took a toll and Tiffany didn't want to live with her mom anymore. She begged to live with her grandmother, but her mom would say, She's not your mama, I'm your mama. Since Tiffany was the eldest of her four siblings, she was forced into a mother role. She told people, I was basically a 10-year-old mom. I was feeding them and dressing them. I was taking care of everybody. This also included being her mom's caretaker and teaching her how to tie her shoes. Things came to a head when Tiffany was 12. She wrote in her memoir that her mom hit a male neighbor with a stick and accidentally hit his baby. The cops were called and Tiffany's mom underwent an evaluation where she was diagnosed with schizophrenia and placed in a state mental facility. Tiffany and her siblings were separated and placed into foster care. She told People Magazine her sisters were placed in one home, her brothers were placed in another home, and she was in a separate home all by herself. Forced to attend a new middle school, she would leave her foster home at 5 a.m. and take a bus to her old school, where she felt more comfortable. Her foster parents would report her missing. The police and her social worker would frequently pick Tiffany up and take her back to her new school. While in foster care, things got increasingly worse. In her memoir, she revealed she was mistreated at the age of 13 when the live-in father of her foster mother caught her stuffing toilet paper in her training bra. He told her that he knew how to make her chest grow, and every day for 15 minutes, he would take advantage of her. Tiffany said she didn't realize what happened was inappropriate until years later when she opened up to a friend about it. Things continued to decline at school as well. She stated she was basically illiterate and couldn't read or write up until the ninth grade. She still managed to take AP classes by getting people to read things to her, but everyone eventually caught on. Her classmates, mother, stepfather, and grandmother would call her stupid. But a teacher who noticed her struggles decided to step in and gave Tiffany private lessons to help her succeed. In an attempt to make friends, she decided laughter was the best way to make people like her. She told People Magazine she would make up imaginary friends and talk to them to make the other kids laugh. While it won them over, it also caused concern for her teachers who thought there was something mentally wrong with her. At the age of 15, she and her siblings were reunited and placed in her grandmother's care. But her social worker was still worried about her and gave her the option to either go to psychiatric therapy or go to Laugh Factory Camp. She chose the camp, and her comedic gifts flourished. While there, she was mentored by comedy greats like Richard Pryor, the Waynes brothers, Dane Cook, and Charlie Fleischer, whom she still considers a mentor. While her life appeared to be going in the right direction, she faced yet another traumatic event when she was 17. After her homecoming dance, a man who was also a police cadet offered to take her home. Instead, he drove her to his place where the unthinkable happened. She reported the incident, but the perpetrator was never arrested. She told Glamour Magazine, that whole experience put me in such a messed up place for a long time, and I ended up going to counseling. Still dealing with the aftermath of that event, her grandmother kicked her out of the house at the age of 18. Homeless with nowhere to go, she would sleep on friends' couches. Even though she was accepted to New York University, she couldn't afford to attend, so she enrolled in Santa Monica Community College. At one point, Tiffany's sketch comedy co-star noticed that she was homeless and living out of her car. That person just so happened to be Kevin Hart. Tiffany told Vanity Fair that Kevin asked her, you're a beautiful woman, you could stay with any man. Why don't you just stay with a man? Tiffany answered, I'm not sleeping with nobody for a roof over my head. In an Instagram caption, Tiffany wrote that Kevin gave her all the money he had at the time, which was $300, so she could get a hotel room for the week. He also suggested she write down her goals to make them come true. A week later, she was able to get an apartment for $550 a month. Things were looking up for her, but she was emotionally run down. An unplanned pregnancy which she chose to terminate, and at the tender age of 21, she felt she didn't want to live anymore. She told The Breakfast Club she met up with her stepdad and he encouraged her to cheer up because she wasn't even supposed to be here. He further explained he was the one who snipped her mother's brakes before her terrifying car accident, and Tiffany and her siblings were supposed to be in the car with her. She still isn't sure if he was joking or telling the truth, and her stepfather was never prosecuted. On The Breakfast Club, Tiffany explained that an unexpected encounter on a cruise led her to meet a man named William Stewart. 
When he told her he was a police officer, she told him it would be nice to have a cop friend and maybe he could help her find her biological dad one day. They chatted for about a year, but because he was a lot older, she realized that she didn't want to date him. They stopped talking and she changed her number. Five or six years later, after seeing her on Bill Bellamy's Who's Got Jokes, William decided to track her down. By that point, he had become a private investigator, so he was able to locate her. He told her all the things he did to find her, and she told him, maybe if you can find me, you can find my daddy. He said he would, but it would cost her. William said that if he found him, she would have to marry him. He kept his word and found her dad in three weeks' time. Tiffany said, I'm a woman of my word. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. They got married in 2008, and her dad walked her down the aisle. Tiffany called it one of the happiest days of her life. The happy days wouldn't last long. According to Radar Online, she was granted a temporary restraining order in 2011 after she accused William of putting his hands on her multiple times. She later dropped the order of protection. Though she wrote in her memoir that they divorced in 2011, remarried and got divorced again, TMZ reported William said they stayed married until they officially got divorced in 2013. She told The Breakfast Club William couldn't handle her career. She felt that she had given everything, but she still wasn't good enough. She thought he was trying to shut down her dreams and said he later admitted he was afraid that if her career took off, she wouldn't need him anymore. Though her marriage was over, her career was heating up. She had roles in Real Husbands of Hollywood, If Loving You Is Wrong, and The Carmichael Show. Sadly, her biological father passed away in May 2017, just months before her breakout role in the 2017 movie Girls Trip. Her memoir was released in December 2017, and according to TMZ, William wasn't pleased with the chapter entitled The Ex-Husband. The chapter aired all the dirty laundry about their marriage, including the assault allegations and the details about Tiffany's alleged miscarriage. Her ex-husband denied all the allegations and even claimed Tiffany never suffered a miscarriage. He said she actually terminated the pregnancy. In an interview with V103, William said Tiffany warned him before the book came out and told him he would be furious with what it included. Tiffany shared on Snapchat that some of the stories were exaggerated during the editing process. However, in 2018, William filed a $1 million lawsuit against Tiffany, her co-author, and her publisher. As of this video, the case is still pending. Despite all that she has gone through, Tiffany remains focused on making a name for herself in the entertainment industry. In 2017, she made history as the first black female comedian to host Saturday Night Live and won a Primetime Emmy for it. She has been nominated for numerous Critics' Choice Awards and even teamed up with her old friend Kevin Hart to star in the 2018 film Night School. When she isn't working, she gives her time and resources to the Unusual Suspects Theatre Company, which provides workshops for youth and adults in underserved communities. Things in her personal life are going great as well. She has plans to move her mom from a mental institution into a duplex where she can have a full-time nurse to take care of her. And in August 2020, she revealed she and the rapper Common became friends after appearing in the movie The Kitchen. After a virtual date, things began to heat up. She told the Steve-O podcast she was in love. She said, this is hands down the best relationship I've ever been in. We wish Tiffany all the best in her life, career, and exciting new romance. Let us know if you're shocked by Tiffany Haddish's life story. And thanks for watching Real Reality Gossip. Hey everybody, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I hope that you liked the video. Not everything mirrors me, it's just her mannerisms and some of the stuff that she uh, embodied through her history that, it, that reminds me of the things I didn't like about myself. And I, I changed my ways because I saw the errors of my ways. And I did some self-evaluation. I had uh, went into a spiritual journey. It was a roller coaster ride. And then um, God started working with me. And I had to unlearn some life uh, uh, experiences that was, that was instilled in me through other generations in my family and to overcome 
the general generation curses that are that was placed on our family with the women of our family uh we just felt like we had to protect ourselves because people was not protecting us so now that we are embodied with the power of the God, of of the word and God that's within and the God that we we serve cuz most of our women in our family are are servants of God <laughs> To what capacity um, is so many? But my journey, I wear many hats. And um, I serve in the way that he wants me to serve. And I do it, you know, with excellence. And I try to do it as a, with a, as much creativity that I can give to you guys to keep you entertained. And what I'm trying to do and convey to you and get you to have some clarity about me and maybe... You might see that within yourself and take a little time out to, you know, sit down and reevaluate your life and see how you can make some um, life changes for your own choice only. We have free will and we have our own choices. So when you decide to be your own person, that's when you go ahead and sit down quietly with the Lord, pray fast. And, and 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 ask for forgiveness and the forgiveness in your heart to forgive others and heal, uh, recover, be delivered and recover and, you know, go on the journey of the spiritual journey, not the religious journey, the spiritual journey of your life and what God has planned for you. I still stick with the, the, um, my my method of talking about the fingerprint we have our own identity we cannot be like other people it only put put us in crash and burn and it's not a good burn okay it's a bad burn so when you are too comfortable with living in the ways of the, of, of the systematic ways of the world you know the devil ain't gonna mess with you because he 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 he, he, he enjoying that you're destroying and devouring the, the plans of God's life for you. But then, when you start walking this journey, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. See, nobody told me this. I didn't ran away from uh, religion and ran away from myself and ran away from things, people, places, and things because I got scared of what was coming up out of me while I was doing what God wanted me to do. And now that I am at a place in my life where people don't matter to me, they matter in the ways of what God want, how to God want me to handle you guys. But I don't embody or take on what I cannot do for myself. Okay. Or I don't put too much on my plate where it overcomes what I'm trying to do for me and my family, okay? So you have to be able to juggle and balance the the life of yourself and the lives of others when you are dealing with the public eye and you're trying to get them to see where you're going and where they could be. And that you, that you no, not where they could be, where they can go. You always supposed to direct people in the way they should should go because God has directed you in the way you should go. In all that ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Trust in the Lord with all thy might. And 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 acknowledge him. And he shall direct your path. Not the right, not the complete word, but it is the word. So when you put God first in your life. You, the ways of how you carry yourself, how you how you talk to people, uh, the way you look changes. And then people wouldn't recognize you 100%. They'll be like, hmm, I've seen you somewhere before. Okay? Me, on the other hand, I just look like the same little kid that just grew up. <laughs> maybe a little bigger. Maybe a little more, you know. Yeah, some of that. But... Uh, some people that see me, they just don't recognize me. And I'm kind of good, glad with some of that because some of the people that didn't recognize me and don't recognize me, I'm glad they don't because that's just the devil to putting them in place to try to sneak their way into my life and wreak havoc 
where I come too far to turn back now. In Jesus' name. Jesus loves you and so do I. I may not like your ways, but I love you anyway. In Jesus' name. Bye, y'all. Veins. I've been driving this train Years in this lane, there's no stopping this flame Cause I came to the game and I changed it to play How I like rearranged it to my own domain Yeah, I got what it takes